Uh, I'm Brian Murray, partner and COO at Craft. I know uh, most of you who are on the call, we've still got a bunch more founders trickling in. Um, like we said in our note, we wanted to hold another founder session. It's been about six months since we did this. Um, in this case, we're going to talk about some of the challenges a lot of the startups, uh, a lot of you startups are facing and what you can do about it. David is going to, in a minute, David's going to run through uh, a hypothetical situation that is pretty illustrative of what a lot of people are going through. And then at the end, we're going to leave a lot of time for Q&A. So we got your questions. They're all great. We'll try to address many of them in the content, but there's going to be space at the end for uh, David and Jeff to address those questions. So um, David, why don't you take it away? All right. Thanks, Brian. So the, the talk today is called VC or PE. What's the right framework for thinking about your startup? I'm going to explain the difference between VC thinking and uh, private equity thinking uh, as the talk goes on. Um, and but then I'll get I'll get to that in a minute. But I want to the reason why we're here is I want to expand on some recent commentary that I made and some some of my friends made on the all in pod. Um, where we talked about a, um, a cram down round. And I'm gonna again explain exactly what that means. But it's just important to understand that what we're gonna talk about here today literally can make the difference between whether you as founders work for a decade and get nothing or make millions of dollars. And I've seen this in real life. And the reason why this is coming up is because I've seen it quite recently. Uh, this talk is most applicable to growth stage startups that aren't growing fast, but there are lessons for all founders. So if you're super early stage, it, there's, there's less um, at stake in a way, because if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But there are a lot of uh, growth stage companies where there really is a difference between, you know, whether you make millions or get nothing. There actually is something that's uh, valuable at the end of let's say a decade of work and the decisions you make can make the difference in terms of whether you're able to earn anything for that work or not. So I wanna give you, let's call it a hypothetical example, but it's based on a real case. And I've seen multiple cases like this. So this is absolutely very real. Let's take a, a SaaS startup. It's at a growth stage as 32 million of ARR, but it doesn't have to be SaaS. I know not all of you are SaaS companies, but you know, if you've got tens of millions of dollars of revenue, you're you're definitely in this category. Uh, startup has pretty decent net dollar retention, 110. percent That means that um, the 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 business isn't growing very fast. It's growing at about 15 percent year over year, but uh, the customer base isn't going away. It's a pretty stable subscriber base. This company has raised about 75 million dollars. It still has 30 million dollars of cash in the bank. Um, as a result of being able to raise when times were really good in 2020 or 2021, it has burned about $4 million a quarter. And this is not the company today. This is the company as it was a little over a year ago. Uh, the, the, this is after about 10 years ago, uh, sorry, after about 10 years of work, uh, the state of the company was that the product was quite good. Customers really liked it. But growth had pretty much stalled out. Like I said, it was down to 10, 15% a year. Uh, not surprisingly, the founders were tired. They looked to bring in a professional CEO to reaccelerate the business. The new CEO had a big vision, um, a lot of ambition to grow, create a great outcome. Of course, that sounded really good to the board. New CEO came in and instead of uh, cutting burn, actually doubled the burn from 4 million to 8 million a quarter. This was about a year ago. And I'm, I'm not laying this out to pick on anybody. Again, just consider this hypothetical, but realistic as an example, but I think it's really important for everyone to understand this scenario because um, I think it's a scenario that could happen to a lot of companies. So one year later, which is basically recently, uh, it turns out that growth didn't mean meaningfully accelerate. I think a lot of that has to do with the current economic environment. You're kind of pushing a lot of money into a, a market that's just kind of fundamentally downsizing. Uh, but that caused the company to kind of burn down its war chest again, had 30 million bucks, but which is a lot of money, but when you're burning 8 million a quarter, it goes by pretty fast company then tried to do a fundraising process with VC firms. That process failed. I think that's not surprising. If you're a, um, if you're a VC backed company, that's only growing 15% a year. That is simply not VC eligible. I'll speak later more about what is VC eligible. 
but they could not raise their outside round. And that forced the company to do an internal round, uh, otherwise known as a cram down round. What does a cram down round look like? Well, in this case, they sought to raise $25 million from internal investors. Um, internal investors are expected to contribute uh, pro rata based on their ownership. So in other words, if, uh, but there's no guarantee they will. So in other words, let's say that um, you own 10% of this company and half the company is owned by the preferred that means that you're expected to put in 20% of the round or $5 million. But again, there's no guarantee that the investor will. Maybe they don't have even the capability of doing it. So a cram down round uses a, a carrot and stick to drive participation. The carrot is that they put a 3x liquidation preference on this new money, and they make that senior to all the previous money that's gone to the company. So in other words, if this company sells, the first $75 million will go off the top to go to the investors in this cram down round. Um, in addition to whatever ownership they get uh, in, in the company. So that's, that's the carrot. The stick is that any investor who doesn't participate gets diluted 10 to one. So their previous uh, preferred will get converted into common shares and uh, all the existing preferred, assuming they re-up, they will basically be issued 10 to one stock. Now, if you're a common shareholder and you're not getting re-upped, you're in the same boat as these non-participating investors. You're getting diluted 10 to 1. And that is typically the case for founders who are not still running the company. Um, even if they are still running the company, they may not get re-upped on a 10 to 1 basis. And they're going to have to work for several more years to revest what they already have today. So founders <clears throat> and non-participating investors are typically in the same boat of getting uh Dilute a 10 to 1, hence the uh, term cram down. I think it's important to note that this is subtle, but uh, incentives can diverge between different kinds of investors in these situations. And I'm, I'm not sure like founders totally understand that. Um, so the reason they diverge is that if you think about an early stage investor and a late stage investor who have the same ownership in a company, they're going to have the same pro rata uh, in, in the in the pay to play round, their their uh, their pro rata requirement. I think in this case, pro rata should be seen as a requirement, not as a as a benefit. Uh, that requirement is going to be the same based on their ownership, but the burden falls much differently on them. Um, both because uh, their fund sizes might be very different, and uh, and their initial investment amount might be very different. So let me give an example. Let's say an early stage investor owns 5%, they might, let's say it was a seed investor, they may have put in a million bucks for that 5%. Maybe it was originally 10% and it's gotten diluted down to 5% over time. Late stage investor might've put in $25 million for that 5% if they raised like under peak conditions, top of market in 2021. Well, their pro rata requirements gonna be about, let's call it 10% of the 25 million, which is two and a half million dollars. If you're an early stage investor, you know, two and a half million, that's 250% of your initial investment. And you may not simply have two and a half million dollars in your small seed fund to make that investment, especially because your seed fund, you probably invest that, you know, five, seven, eight, well, 10 years ago. So you simply don't have the capacity to participate. The late stage investor, they already invested 25, putting in another two and a half million is only 10%. So from their standpoint, this is fine. And they get, again, that carrot of the three X liquidation preference. So what happens is the early stage investors, typically the seed investors, they can't participate. They get crammed down. The founders get crammed down. And from the point of view of late stage investors and the new professional CEO has been brought in from the outside, this isn't such a bad thing because now actually it's anti-dilutive for their ownership. They get the carrot of the three X and they've actually taken out the founders and the early stage investors. So from their standpoint, they're not so unhappy with this scenario if they think that there's a some sort of exit in, in the future. And I think it's really important for founders to understand this divergence of incentives, because this is why you need early stage advocates on your board who are fundamentally aligned with you and who can see the future and help you avoid situations like this. Because frankly, late stage investors, just they may not be incentivized the same way. And I'm not dogging on late stage investors. There's a lot of great late stage investors, um, 
who will act totally ethically, but I think it's just important to understand that their sensitivities are gonna be very different. So let's take the example of $150 million exit. What, what happens now after this pay to play round? Well, the first $75 million will be scooped off the top to pay off that three X liquidation preference. And then you still have $75 million from the previous pref stack. Okay, now some of that will have gotten wiped out by the dynamic we're just talking about. Remember the seed investors are the ones who are likely to get, um, who are basically likely to get wiped out. And in terms of absolute dollars in the pref stack, that may have been a very small amount of money. The late stage investors are the ones who put up most of the pref stack and they're the ones who are most likely to participate in the play to play round. It's not as big a deal for them to contribute an extra 10, 20%. They have the funds to do that. In any event, in this scenario, $150 million exit, founders get zero or it, and really the common gets zero because there's $150 million goes to pay off this huge pref stack now. So that's the really unfortunate reality here is that when you create these gigantic pref stacks, it really uh, has a huge impact on the common. And really it should say founders and employees get zero. Now, maybe <clears throat> as part of this um, exit, there'll be some facility that's created for, uh, for, for the ongoing employees, some sort of earn out for them. And that's a very common, but again, you know, if you're a founder and you've, Again, you work for 10 years, but you're, you don't have an active operating role you don't expect to in the new company, then that's not the earnouts may not include you because you're not part of the ongoing entity. So it's just a, a horrible place for founders to find themselves to be after you know many years of work. And this is why I'm doing this presentation is I don't want any of you guys to find yourselves in that situation. All right, there was an alternate path here. So for example, I'm not saying they had to not hire a professional CEO that could have worked, but they also could have considered it promoting candidates from within, maybe test some people. I mean, they had 10 years to do this, build, build a bench. Uh, but the most important thing was instead of increasing the burn to cut the burn, well, how much could you have cut the burn? Let me tell you, there's no reason why a software company that's doing 32 million a year of, uh, of ARR can't operate on call it a million dollars a month of, of OPEX, of operating expense. That's about 40, 50 employees, depending on the rest of your cost structure, maybe more. But if you do that, if you run it that way, you'll not only go from losing money, you'll go to making $20 million at EBITDA a year. Okay, so you don't necessarily have to do this all in one go. I mean, you could decide, okay, first we're just gonna cut to break even and then we're gonna reevaluate. That would have been easy. I mean, this company was only burning 4 million a quarter, so a little over 1 million a month. So they could have um, you know, cut their cost structure by a small percent, a relatively small percentage and gotten to break even. And that would have bought them all the time in the world to make future decisions. But let's say they had decided to cut deep. They could have absolutely run this company on a million bucks a month of OPEX. Now you have the option, you're basically in a private equity model. A private equity model it's important to understand VCs invest in money losing companies because of the expectation of huge future growth. That's why we do it. We don't invest in companies because we like losing money. We invest in companies because we believe that the company is going to lose money for a while, but grow really fast. So we're going to fund extraordinary growth. And then eventually the company will have the ability to generate extraordinary profits because it's just so big. But again, if you're not you know, a VC eligible company because you're simply not growing, that model doesn't apply to you. There's only one other real model out there, which is the private equity model. Private equity firms invest in companies that are profitable. So you have to be profitable. And PE firms will buy companies, software companies that are profitable. They'll frequently do it under a, a model of five to 10 times EBITDA. So you could imagine now, um, this company generating 20 million a year of, of, of EBITDA, this could sell for 150 million bucks easily. And I think moreover, it's important to know that this sales process would, would happen without the pressure of running out of money. You're, you're already profitable. So if you don't like the offers you're getting, just don't take them. You don't have your back against the wall. I mean, one of the reasons why <clears throat> pay to play rounds happen is because the, the company's got its back against the wall. You're, you're basically facing bankruptcy. You're forced to do it. Here, you're not forced to do anything. 
So the odds of generating a good outcome, let's call it like a, a, a middle-sized but good outcome are much greater, much, much greater. No, no, no pressure anymore. So let's compare this now. Let's say that the, that same $150 million <clears throat> exit opportunity happens. So, you know, again, we talked about in the first scenario, the full where we have VC pay to play round, the founders would get nothing because a full 150 goes to pay off the pref stack. In this case, we never did the pay to play round. So you're still gonna have to pay off the $75 million of pref stack, but that's gonna leave 75 million for common and early investors. And let's say that the founders are about one third of that. Uh, they would expect to make about 25 million bucks. So that is, you know, that is a huge outcome compared to getting zero. Now, look, the math, the exact math on this is going to vary quite a bit based on your cap table. But I think it's it, this is a would be a very common scenario. What would happen is that in a situation where a company sells for 150, any growth investor who invested at a valuation higher than 150, assuming it was clean terms, 1x lick pref, they just get their money back. So they get paid off and but also their ownership gets removed from the cap table, assuming it's just one X clean, uh, you know, non-participating preferred, right? So again, you, you basically unwind the cap table back to the point where it's maybe just the, the founders, the employees and early investors who invested at a valuation below, let's call it 75 million. And again, in that situation, there actually is uh, an outcome to go around there that's that will be meaningful for individuals. This is not what VC funds are in the business for. We're not in the business to generate small outcomes, but that's okay. It's a very meaningful outcome for an individual. So how did this happen? You know, how did we get into a situation where on the one hand, founders could have made 25 million and the other, they get zero after 10 years of work. Uh, two ways, gradually then suddenly as Hemingway said of bankruptcy. Uh, there was a process. Uh, before the pay to play round, there was a failed fundraise. Before that, there was the decision to increase burn. Before that, there was a decision to hire a professional CEO and, and have this more, let's call it, you know, more ambitious plan to spend a lot of money to re-accelerate growth. And before that was sort of founder fatigue, right? I mean, this is like the common, common scenario. And so, the point of recognition that, oh, gee, like the, the kind of oh shit moment was after the failed fundraise. That's when everyone realized, oh, wow, like the path we're on, like was not a good path. And now we're forced to do a pay to play round where like the reason why people <clears throat> accept basically getting crammed down and wiped out is they don't have a choice. So, <clears throat> so that's the moment of recognition. But when did the turning point occur? Well, when this plan happened to accelerate burn instead of cutting it, that was the turning point. And that was somewhere around this process of hiring a new CEO with this um, ambitious plan. So what should have happened, I think, is that unfortunately the board should have, I think, asked more questions here and expressed more skepticism about the plan to reaccelerate growth in the face of a fundamentally recessionary market. But that didn't happen. So common mistakes here. This is not, you know, again, I'm, I'm zooming out a little bit because, again, I see these all the time. It's not just this one company that we're talking about. Number one, raising burn instead of cutting it. Huge mistake. Number two, always assuming there will be another round. I just see this thinking all the time. I don't know if you guys have seen the latest crunch base data about uh, growth funding, specifically Series C. Uh, we've gone down from 10 billion a quarter plus, uh, basically at the peak of the market, which was Q4 2021. That's been steadily headed down. And, and now it's a little bit misleading because that Q2 2023, that was only a partial quarter. But even if you multiply that by three, because I think it was maybe one month in, uh, you can see how much growth stage funding has dried up. It has really dried up. It is really hard right now to raise growth stage funding. Moreover, the type of round you can raise today at the growth stage is so different than that peak of market in Q4 of 
2021. Let's say you were able to raise a $100 million round in Q4 of 2021. Even if you have the metrics to raise again it now, it's not going to be a $100 million round. This, the, the round sizes have come down significantly. It might be 25 or $30 million. And of course, you're not going to like the valuation nearly as much as you did in 2021. So this like thinking of there's always one more round out there. There's not. The funding may not be available. It's only going to be available to growth stage companies with outstanding metrics. And even if they can raise, it's going to be a fraction of the round size. So if you think if you think about it, let's say you're a growth stage company raised $100 million at peak of market. If you had just used that money 30% more efficiently and saved an extra 30 million, that would have been your next round. That would have been your next round. Uh, number three, magical thinking around professional CEO. I'm not against hiring professional CEOs if founders feel like that they're at the end of their journey, but there's way too much... Um, kind of utopian thinking that you're going to be able to find this perfect unicorn person who's going to come in and just magically fix all the problems. I think it's an extremely risky thing to do. The professional CEO will take three to six months just to kind of learn the business. Then they're going to want to bring in their own team. They're going to want to make all their changes. Then we're going to find out whether those changes worked and they're going to need time to adjust. You, you basically can easily waste a year. I I would so much rather see founders, if they, they feel like they're just kind of too fatigued to move on, they kind of groom internal talent to take over, try out, promote someone as CEO and see how they do and let them grow into the role, stay involved. I don't, you know, it, it's always a mistake when founders um, lose their involvement in a company. So much rather see a founder graduate to executive chairman and stay involved working with an internally promoted CEO then bring in someone from the outside and you're really rolling the dice, especially when you only have, call it 18 months of runway left. Because the new CEO, I mean, like I said, six months to figure out what's going on, a year to execute their plan. Then you basically find out at the end of it, oh, it didn't work. And we're in the middle. Now we have to do this cram down round. And if you're a founder who's not highly involved, again, you're not going to get re-upped. So you're going to get totally crushed by that. So it would have been a lot better to have shifted your mentality from, again, this uh, a VC mindset, which is sort of this mindset of, of hyper growth to a PE mindset of how do we um, get to profitability? And actually I tweeted about this way back in um, May, a year ago, May of 2022, and I said, founders can afford to have a VC mindset towards profitability, or, or be, which is really the lack thereof, if they have VC level growth. So if you have growth, you are VC eligible, and therefore you can have a VC mindset. But if you only have PE level growth, which is modest, 10, 15%, really up 50%, you're going to need to adopt a PE mindset towards profitability, which is you need to get to it at some point pretty soon. And it was interesting, you know, Orlando Bravo sort of, um, he chimed in around this. He is a very successful private equity investor. And he said, you know, this points to the problem with public markets today. So many companies are growing around 50% and have scale, actually um, much higher than 100 million are highly unprofitable. So this is like what's been happening in the public markets too, is that software companies that aren't profitable have been getting dinged because there's been a regime change of the market public market shifting from valuing kind of growth at all costs to valuing profitability. And the software companies that are able to achieve profitability have their stock prices have done well. In any event, um, you know, you don't need to be at like a public company stage, but the point is just this thinking from the public markets is flowing through to later stage investors. So how do you know if you're VC eligible? We had a version of this slide, I think on our last presentation, we've adjusted it a little bit in light of market conditions. Um, you know, great growth is still 3X year over year. That is really hard right now. I mean, we are not seeing that uh, very often from anybody, especially at a growth stage. Uh, frankly, if you can just double, if you can do 2X year over year, that is extremely good under current conditions. Uh, we've revised this number down from two and a half to two times because of market conditions. Still, if you're growing less than 100% year over year, 
that's not really, you're, you're in the danger zone. And certainly if you're at like 50, 60% growth, you're just not VC eligible. I don't think VCs are doing those rounds. Gross margins, 80% is great, 50% good. You know, under 20%, no one's going to fund you. Um, negative gross margins, forget about it. You're not going to raise around. Net dollar retention, 120% plus is great. 100% uh, above 100% is good. We, again, we lowered this. Great used to be 140% and good used to be 120%. In the current market conditions, because we're seeing seat contraction rather than seat expansion and companies are sharpening their pencils, if you can just stay above 100% not dollar retention, I think that's good. Under 100% danger zone. Uh, CAC payback rate is six to 12 months, good 12 to 18 months, danger zone over 24 months. And then burn multiple, one or less, great, good would be in the one to 1 1.5 and danger zones over two. So you have to be realistic about whether you're VC eligible. I think the most important metrics here are the growth rate and, um, and uh, the, the, the net dollar retention and then the, the sort of the capital efficiency. Um, I think it's important to note that it is possible to reaccelerate your business. Uh, if your growth has slipped, you can reaccelerate. But what you want to be really careful of is spending a lot of money in the in the teeth of a really negative market to try and reaccelerate. Uh, think about it like a plane. You know, a plane hits tremendous headwinds. You know, the headwinds of market conditions. Now, you can maintain your speed by burning a ton of fuel but that's not very efficient. You'd be a lot better off not burning as much fuel, slowing your speed, just accepting lower growth and then waiting for the market to recover. And then you can reaccelerate, or at least this is like a way you should be thinking about uh, how to conserve and spend your fuel. I think it's really important to understand that if your growth is slow anyway, you're not VC eligible. So this is the last money you're gonna have. So it'd be a lot better to drop your, your speed. If, if it is the last money you're gonna have, you need to start thinking again in this, drop your speed, start thinking in more of a PE way. All right, let's uh, take questions. So, uh, so I'm here, other members of the craft are here, Jeff Floor is here. Jeff actually worked at um, a private equity firm. So he has some thoughts on like how PE firms think. By the way, we're not like fans of PE. Like we like being VCs, but we're letting you guys know about like a different way of thinking about your business that for some of you might be more applicable. Jeff, you wanna chime in with that? Yeah, sure. So um, yeah, as David mentioned, I actually my, my very first job out of, uh, out of school was at Blackstone in New York, which is a big PE firm. So I've, I've sort of seen um, kind of that thinking and um, and and how they um, how they look at businesses and how they value businesses. And I mean, I think fundamentally, probably the most important thing is they they really are only investing in businesses that generate positive cash flow, um, which it, which which in most cases means businesses that are profitable. Um, so so yeah, I think it comes down to you, you you're either you know growing fast and um, and have have really solid metrics for the next round of VC funding, or you're not. In which case, you really got to get to profitability, and you got to generate positive cash flow so that you can have an outcome, uh, even if it's not as big an outcome as it might otherwise be. Um, and those are both, you know, completely viable options. But you know, there's a a bunch of um, a bunch of scenarios where neither of those are possible, and those are those are really the scenarios that we want you to try to avoid. Yeah, and uh, Pete and Angie had a comment in the chat. If it's going to be a small outcome, let's at least make sure it's a small outcome that the common can actually participate in. Exactly, exactly. Um, so now, look, if you're if you're an early stage company with sub one million of ARR and you're it's kind of just not working. Realistically, there's probably not much to save there. Um, I mean, maybe it could work out and be an aqua hire. Uh, for sure, that's possible, and that is often better than nothing. But what we're really talking about here, I mean, in the, case, in the example I gave you, this company had something valuable, right? I mean, 32 million of ARR, that is a stable subscriber base of revenue, 110% NDR, uh, that's a valuable business. And the only reason it is going to generate a zero for the founders, most likely, is because of the burn. 
So if you just correct the burn, you not only do you give yourself all the time in the world, you'll actually, you, you fundamentally change the capital stack and give yourself the chance of an outcome. So again, this is about making sure that when you have something valuable, that's not necessarily a home run, but it's more of a base hit that you actually can participate in it. Now, here's the tragic thing. In the example I gave, they're going to raise 25 million through a pay to play round. N now, what are their choices? Their choices are continue running this thing at 8 million bucks a burn a quarter. It's the metrics probably not going to improve because we're still in a recession. I don't care what anybody tells you. We're definitely in a software recession. So they're going to find themselves in the exact same situation a, a year from now, unless they massively cut burn. And by the way, like no one's going to do the pay to play twice. So on their current path, they're going to be out of business in a year anyway, or they're going to slash burn and do what they should have done a year ago. So they're probably going to cut the burn to what they should do is break even, you know, just run this thing at break even, but they could have done that a year ago before the pay or play round. So this is the thing I hate to see is when founders could have made the decision earlier and then they don't, and then they end up with nothing. Um, and that's when I usually get the phone call. It's like, oh, Dave, we should listen to you. That sucks for everybody. All right. We had a bunch of questions that were sent in before. I'm going to hit some of those. But in the meantime, if you have any questions, drop them into the chat and we'll cover them. But there were a lot of questions that came in uh, generally about the funding landscape. David, you touched on this, um, particularly on the late stage. But there were some questions around how does um, the current uh, conditions on early stage versus late stage funding look? Um, what to make of these uh, these outlier deals that we're seeing in AI? And if you have any thoughts on a recovery timeframe, when things will, when the ice will thaw? Yeah, so the way I would describe the, the venture environment, the venture funding environment right now is a, a tale of two cities. Uh, it's the best of times for AI startups and it's the worst of times for everybody else. So if you're an AI company, uh, you know, and I'd say especially like early stage, like seed stage series A, it, there's no shortage of capital. VCs are kind of throwing money at, at you. Um, I, I'd still say you have to have something. It's not like totally uh, indiscriminate, but it is frothy for sure. Uh, and there's a handful of AI companies that are kind of leaders in their emerging categories uh, that have raised pretty spectacular rounds. But again, those companies tend to be the leaders in an early category, you know, like, like you had like Pinecone or whatever, do a $700 million round, but they're the leader in vector databases um, and, and so on down the line. So they're, they're, basically there's a reason, right? Like VCs can be... Um, VCs can drink the Kool-Aid, but they're not like totally stupid. So th there's a reason for this. Um, but in any event, the, the the funding spigot is really turned on for those AI companies. It does this does not apply to the whole market. So for pre-AI companies, especially companies that raise growth funding in 2020 and 2021, because almost by definition they were they're not AI companies. Uh, there is no funding. There's just no funding. It is extremely hard to raise around. Um, and part of the reason is because the growth has slowed down across the board. Let me tell you, if you're still able to grow your ARR, um, you know, uh, 2X to 3X year over year, like you're an outlier right now. It's, it's really hard. So there is just no funding. You really have to proceed on the assumption that there's no growth funding. Now, will it get better? Maybe, but... I think we're at the beginning of, um, of uh, I mean, there are green shoots with AI, but I think that uh, the, the, the current economic cycle could last a long time. I think the larger economy is very challenged. We have a banking crisis, could be going into a recession. Um, the, 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 the money supply keeps contracting. And regardless of when this recession ends, it's just never going to be like it was in 2020 and 2021. Those conditions were massively inflated because of, call it roughly 10 trillion of money printing that came out of the federal government, both the Fed and Congress. And uh, we're never gonna see anything like that again. Um, it, uh, it created a huge asset level. And that was reflected in all the valuations and the amount of money. I mean, so many of those late stage investors who inflated the market in 2021, they're just gone. You know, they were, crossover investors, so-called tourist investors, and they're just not here anymore. So those funds are, are gone. Um, 
in terms of VC funds that were able to that have um, raised a lot of money and sitting on dry powder, it's um, they're, they're just being much more judicious about their pace of, of deployment. So you know, it's like yeah, that the, there are quite a few funds that have been raised, but they're they're sitting on their eggs like a mother hen and not dishing them out. And if and if the, those funds go from a one year pace of deployment to a three year pace of deployment, that's a two thirds reduction in the availability of capital. And then that capital is really going to kind of the this hot new area of AI. So um, people are just definitely less excited about um, bailing out uh, a company that doesn't have good growth. But like, why would they, right? That's not what new VC funds are for. You made the point about um, if you're an outlier, if you're growing two to three X, uh, one, one qualifier to that is Looking at it on a full year-over-year -year basis could be misleading. Look at the recent rate of growth. We we look at CMGR. Uh, we have SAS Grid that's helpful for this. So um, just because you 2x since last year, you really got to scrutinize how the growth has looked more recently. Yeah, you should really, I mean, the, the best way to look at growth is to take your quarterly, most recent quarters net UARR, and it could be done on a rolling three-month basis and just multiply by four. That's going to be a lot more honest. Um, there are tons of companies who are like net flat right now because they are growing, but they're also at trading. Uh, churn is much higher too. So, and look, these are good companies. I do believe that they will. I, I do believe that, that when we get through this period, these companies will figure out how to reaccelerate and grow, provided they've given themselves the time and runway to do that. In the same way that we had peak conditions and. 2021 and everyone looked i mean everyone's numbers looked amazing and everyone kind of maybe looked stronger and better than they were i think probably everyone right now looks worse than they actually are too and we will come through this period but you have to give yourself the runway to, to come through it otherwise you'll be one of those people doing a cram down and it's going to be miserable Okay, let's take some questions from the chat. Arthur asks, uh, for early stage companies, if a company can hit 2 million ARR in one year, in year one, uh, with minimal burn, is that preferred to another scenario where the company can hit 5 million ARR with much higher burn? So, um, okay, so the good news is, like, this is this is a, a choice between kind of two high-class problems, in a way. Um, if you can grow rapidly, then you are VC eligible and you can afford to be unprofitable. I mean, that is the whole VC model, right? Is we fund lack of profitability so you can buy market share so that you can establish a moat and take over the market before like a bunch of competitors get in there. So it's not like we've stopped believing in the VC model. That's kind of, that kind of is it. Now I would temper when you say much higher burn, the question is how much higher and for that you got to look at burn multiple and you got to look at cac payback and you got to look at the efficiency of growth so go back to that slide where you know i said look a, a great cac payback is 6 to 12 months good is 12 to 18 months do not do like more than 2 year cac payback do not do a burn multiple of more than 2 so but um but look if you could rapidly accelerate to 5 million with a burn multiple of 1 uh yeah that that sounds really good yeah i would i would raise vc money for that and you can raise vc money for i think that strategy okay there was a ton of questions about ai of course um uh, vincenzo asked a good one i've heard this one plenty of times um any thoughts on companies that raised in the previous ai <clears throat> era that can now implement significant product features using current ai technologies I think a spin on this question is there's a lot of company, a lot, a lot of the people tuning in right now who have AI as a part of their, their uh, value prop, but they introduced that over a year ago. Uh, and now all these new crop of AI companies are coming up. Do you have any advice for how to lean into the AI elements of your business? Yeah, I think the most important thing here for companies that were working on AI before the boom is to not get trapped in a sunk cost fallacy meaning let's say you spent many millions of dollars on r d to develop a piece of technology that frankly is now an api that you could get and like the api is better than what you did like don't hold on to that legacy you really you know as a startup the, the great advantage you have 
over big companies. Big companies have all these resources, but you have flexibility. So it's really important not to get trapped in, in any kind of legacy, legacy code, legacy thinking, legacy business model. You should always be thinking, you should always be all in on your best idea and you should be thinking about it from the point of view of a clean sheet of paper. So it's like, if I was starting this company today, what would I be doing? And, um, and so just make sure, like if you were doing, a, if you were ahead of the curve on doing AI, that's a good thing, but make sure you're now taking advantage of all the latest technology and don't cling to something you were doing before that might've made sense a year ago, but doesn't make so much sense today. Always do the thing that makes sense today. Jeff, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, look, well, a couple of things. So one is we, we've definitely been advising companies to try to figure out how they can leverage um, you know, the, the, the latest AI technologies, large language models, um, and others to, 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 you know, to improve their business, to improve their product, their value prop, um, and grow faster. And, and I think in many cases, there are ways of doing that. Um, it's, it, it probably has to be more than just like throwing the word AI on your website or getting like a .ai domain or something. It can't be like smoke and mirrors, but there are actually real ways of, of improving your business with, um, with the latest technologies, especially if you have kind of a proprietary data set as part of your business that you can use to, um, to either, you know, fine tune models or, or to create embeddings to, to make, um, to make models better and, and use that proprietary data in a way that um, really supercharges your product. So we, I, I do think that makes sense for companies to do um, and to put energy into, uh, but I think it has to be sort of real as opposed to superficial. Yeah, I, I think it's a great point. And um, yeah, look, everybody should be thinking about how to incorporate AI into their product roadmap if they're not already. Um, it can't be fake, but there are, there's so many opportunities now. Um, I think it is worth thinking. You know, it's a little bit like when when um, mobile came out uh, in 2007, 2008 timeframe. Uh, I mean, everybody had to think about like, what was their mobile strategy? And I think everyone should be similarly thinking about their AI strategy. All right, Beamer next. Yeah, um, a question about, uh, we're talking about how two to three X, you're an outlier, um, but there's the element of the VCs being mother hens sitting on their eggs. So if you have those metrics and you go out to fundraise right now, what kind of a, what kind of challenges are these founders going to be facing? Are you better off trying to wait a while if you can, even if you have those two to three X year year metrics? Well, I think fundamentally the reason why you raise money is because you, you need to, and you don't want to wait until your back's against the wall and, and there's existential risk. So I, I would say that you go raise when you need it and don't wait too long. And remember that your numbers can always change in an adverse way as well as a positive way. So, um, you know, I like to fundraise uh, a year before my cash out date and nine months at the latest. I mean, so let me work backwards for you from, from like how I see this work. So by the time a, um, a startup ha has, call it three months of cash left, all of a sudden all the board conversations are about bankruptcy and winding down and filing. And all of a sudden the lawyers, there's like a new lawyers involved. And they're all of a sudden warning you about all sorts of, uh, you know, legal obligations that the, that you have as a company and as a board, you know. And so, for example, board members are personally liable for unpaid wages. So all of a sudden, everyone's freaking out, and you don't have much time uh, to do anything except try and wind this down in an elegant way. So that's three months from cash out date. So six months from cash out date is really your last chance to do a funding round, I think. But in that situation, your back is going to be against the wall and you may not like the terms you get. And, and if it's a failed process, you're kind of screwed. So therefore, I don't like fun, I like fundraising earlier. So that'd be like nine months because at least if something goes wrong at nine months, you've got like a little bit of time to adapt. But so much the better to do it at one year because if you have a failed process, you could at least slash your burn and turn one year of runway into two years of runway. You still have time to do that. So that's like my thought process and how I think about um, when's the right time to raise and then of course you know if vcs are throwing money at you that's also a good time to raise i mean old saying in this business uh make hay while the sun shines if for whatever reason you're in a privileged position and vcs are throwing money at you uh you know i seriously consider taking that because um fortune can change on you Yeah, one more, and then we can probably wrap. Um, 
just if you can underscore a point you made earlier uh, about reacceleration, I think a lot of founders are hearing mixed messages when it comes to that, that it's impossible to reaccelerate. Um, so um, if you can give the founders on the call who are considering that or, or planning on having to do that before they can go out and raise again, um, just some words of wisdom or confidence on, you know, why that can be part, part of their future plan. Well, I mean, you can improve your product market fit. I mean, the, you, I mean, hopefully you're still working on the product. And one of the one of the things you often want to do when things aren't working is bring your burn down to give yourself time to retool. There's no point having like a huge go to market organization, for example, when it's not working and then you're burning a lot. Like you're better off taking it down. Sometimes you're better off taking it down to the studs, and you have a, a, a like hopefully you have a great R and D team, and you just crank away on the product to make the product fundamentally better. And you maintain your existing customer base and you still do some sales, but you don't put as much um, fuel into it. And then you improve your product market fit. You can do things like add AI. You can think about pivots or small pivots or whatever. And then you go back into market. And then at the same time, market conditions are improving. So, I, you know, again, I do think we are in a little bit of a software recession. So there's always ways to reaccelerate because you can improve your, your product and your product market fit. Um, but you have to give yourself the time to do it. Now, look, if you're uh, a company that's growing two to three X year over year with hundred percent plus net dollar retention and, um, and, you know, one year CAC payback and a burn multiple of, of one, uh, like you should be doing that all day. Maybe you should be burning more money, but you should, but you'll be able to go out and fundraise for that company. So if you're in that bucket, like this recession could be a great opportunity for you to accelerate your business, maybe make some acquisitions to outpace your competitors, maybe, you know, again, raise more money, spend more money, uh, grow faster. There will be companies that actually can use a recession to their advantage. But if you're not in that bucket, if you're in the bucket of, I don't know, sub 50% growth and burning too much money, like, you know, and you try, your goal is to like accelerate your way out of it by spending even more to go from 50 to hundred, I guess in theory it might work, but it also may like, you may end up like this other company where you're just screwed. I would rather see you cut your burn because I, I think like software development doesn't take like a ton of burn. I don't think that's where the money gets wasted. Um, so I'd much rather see you conserve your cash fix your problems as a business, wait for the market to recover a little bit, and then reaccelerate out of it. Jeff, do you have any thoughts on this? Well, I guess I would say, um, generally speaking, in the absence of like economic cycles or like a, a new product uh, sort of innovation that improves product market fit, as David said, I think in general, growth rates do go down over time, right? So like if you're tripling you know, out of the gates, you're probably not going to be tripling at, you know, if you're tripling at a million of revenue, you're not going to be tripling at you know, 10 or 20 million of revenue, generally speaking, that, that rate does fall over time. I think in periods like this, where you've got, um, you know, the, the additional uh, layer of um, an economic downturn followed by, you know, potentially and likely a, a recovery, yeah, that, that tailwind can kind of reaccelerate growth. Or if you have like a new AI um, set of features in your product that, that customers love, that can accelerate growth. But I think the, the, the broader point is, is true that growth rates do decrease over time. Um, and that is probably, you know, the law of large numbers is probably something that, you know, will most companies will um, will have to you know face as they grow. Yeah, and I guess I guess one thing we should say is it depends how much reacceleration you want to do. Like if you're at 80 percent growth rate, can you accelerate to 100 percent? Yeah, I think there, I'm sure there are things you can do to improve to do that. But we have a lot of companies, not a lot, but I mean, there are companies in our portfolio and there's plenty of companies around um, that are like at flat, like they're just not growing. Um, especially if you're looking at it like on multiplying most recent quarter by four to accelerate from like a 0% growth rate to hundred percent growth rate. That is a monumental challenge, right? Especially if you're already burning a lot of money. So you're just not getting any growth for all this burn. That's a situation where you need to restructure. And the sooner you do that, the better, because you'll have more of your cash left. Um, I mean, you know, we know companies that have, I don't know, 50, 60 million of annual revenue and they're burning huge amounts of money and they're not growing. That is exactly the kind of company that would instantly be attractive 
as under a private equity model, but but is completely unattractive under a VC model. But the founders have to be willing to pivot to that model. If they do that, they're going to have a good outcome. If they don't do it, they're taking a huge risk. They're going to get zero. Well, and, and just to be clear on that point, they need to be profitable, right? They need to cut that burn to get to profitability in order to be attractive for a PE model. All right. I think we're good. Uh, we covered a lot of stuff here. Thank you for everybody for attending. Um, we will, um, we recorded the session. We'll be following up with some highlights. Um, David, Jeff, thank you for answering questions and um, hope everyone has a great Friday, great weekend, and uh, we'll talk to you all soon. Thanks. Thanks everyone. Thanks for participating. Thank you. Thank you.